title of the message this morning is, Here Comes the Dreamer. Here Comes the Dreamer. What do you think this sermon, who do you think this sermon is about? Joseph, hey, we've got some Bible scholars here, Bob. Tell them what they want. Here Comes the Dreamer. Last week we discussed a little bit, we're, we're going to go a little bit farther. In the year 2015, I believe that God wants us to find the dream. Now, some people have said, what is the dream? Now, in my definition, the dream is that plan that God has. My dream is the plan that God has for my life. That perfect plan. That if I can stay, you ever been in the sweet spot of something? Yeah, yeah. I, I remember, maybe I shared this before, I don't remember. But when I was a teenager, I wasn't, I wasn't real athletic. I had to give 110% to keep up with the other kids. And, and I didn't have, I had balance, but, you know, it just, it wasn't quite what, what I needed. And I remember we were sledding. How many of you ever been to Lima, Ohio? Try to find a sledding hill in Lima, Ohio. It is just flat. We had to go to the reservoir. Yes, yeah, same thing. Flat as can be. We had to go to the reservoir. So we went, we went to Breath, I believe it was Breslau's Reservoir, whole group of us, and we were sledding. We were sledding down the hill, and you know, and reservoirs are pretty much just straight down and you're done. And uh, we were sledding, I was getting a little bit bored with just the, the steep climb up and then a quick trip down. So I decided I'm going to stand up on my sled. And I didn't have a regular sled. I had, you remember the plastic ones that rolled up? You know, you, they roll all up, and, and you unroll them, and you had to hold them out and sit on them to slide down. Well, I took that sled, and I put my right foot forward at the front, I bent down, I grabbed the handle, I put my left foot at the back, and I, I did my Elvis impersonation. Then I headed down, the, and all of a sudden, it dawned on, I could feel it. I was, I was in the sweet spot. I mean, I was in the per, and as I went, I thought, oh, Ooh, I can feel it. And then I thought, I can steer this. And I was steering a little bit. And I looked over and some kids had built this, this ramp. But I thought, I can hit that. And so I, I stood and I went straight for it. And I thought, here we go. And I hit it. Went up perfect. And I came down perfect. Except the roll-up snow sleds rolled up around my right foot. <laughs> and my left foot had nothing under it but boot. <laughs> and the left foot planted and the right foot kept going. And I became a wishbone. <laughs> and my left knee blew out. And I hobbled her, and to this day, if, if someone were to say the building's on fire, I could run out, but by the time, if I didn't warm up first and I just took off running, it'd be swelled all up and I'd be hobbling around for a while. So, uh, but that's, I found the sweet, you could just feel it. It was, I can't explain it to you, it was incredible to find the sweet spot and know that that was it. And I believe that when we find the sweet spot, and how many of you know, I, my grandpa used to preach this. People get mad at, <clears throat> mad at me, but I believe my grandpa. <laughs> and I called him affectionately Bobo. And uh, Grandpa Bobo, and uh, he was a pastor. And he, he told me one time, he said, I believe there's, you, can, you can live, there's two wills of God that you can live in. He said, there's the divine will of God, and there is the permissive will of God. The divine will of God is when, when you are living in it and you are doing what God wants you to do and you are about his business. When you are in the sweet spot, that is the divine will of God. But when you're saved, in the Bible, you ever heard the Bible talk about saved as by fire? You, you, you make it in just by the skin of your teeth. You, you just, it, it was it almost kind of iffy. And, and the Bible, that, is, that is living in the permissive will of God. I've, I've known of people that, that God has called them to a certain place, a certain position, and they have, they have decided that they were going to do their own thing. Does that mean they're not saved anymore? No, I don't believe so. I hope not. But I believe they're in God's permissive will instead of his divine will. And for the, for the year 2015, I, my prayer is that each one here at Waters Edge Assembly of God have the opportunity to find that sweet spot, to recognize God's divine will for their life, and not only to see what that is, how many of you know a picture on a wall is a beautiful thing, but to step into it. I can, I can show you some beautiful pictures 
of where we went white water rafting. And, oh, it's wonderful to take to look at those pictures, but it's nothing like being in the boat. And God doesn't want us looking at the pictures. He wants us to get in the boat. And this year for 2015, I believe God wants us to find that sweet spot. And the way it begins this week, for those of you that weren't here last week or may have somehow forgotten, this week is our week of prayer in the Assemblies of God. They're inviting all Assembly of God churches around the world, which entails millions upon millions of people, are going to be praying this week. And they don't have, they aren't, you know, some of them are putting specifics. Here's what you're praying for. Here's what you're praying for. You know, we want to see this happen. And I want us to be praying that God's will is done in our lives. Because if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then everything else will take its place. And I want to encourage you over this week, uh, I'm going to be taking time in prayer and fasting during this week. I want to encourage you to ask God what it is that he would like you to fast. Personally, for me, he knows that I don't like going without food, so he's told me I'm going to fast food. <laughs> Not fast food. <laughs> fast food. But for you, I was talking to somebody that said they just love ice cream. And they believe God's probably telling them they need to stay off the ice cream this week. And instead of eating a bowl of ice cream, take the time to spend, spend it with the Lord. Maybe, maybe the Lord's dealing with you about spending too much time on TV or on the computer or whatever hobby you're invested in. Or, or maybe, uh, and God has done this to me before, and I thank him that it's food this time. There have been times when he said, I want you to talk to me instead of sleep. Anybody had that before? You don't need to sleep right now. You need to talk to me. <laughs> I don't do good without my rest. I get kind of mean and grumpy. But uh, uh, this week, whatever it is that God lays on your heart, I want you to take a reasonable amount of time to fast that and spend time in prayer. I promise you, if you will spend time in prayer, God always, always rewards his people. When his people pray, he hears their voice. And this, this morning, I, I just want to encourage you in that. Now, as we look at the, the sermon this morning, the message this morning, if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. And yes, by the way, that had nothing to do with the message. That, that was... Just me throwing that in. Now we get into the message. Genesis 37. And we're going to begin in verse 13. As we look at here comes the dreamer. We see here Israel. You like that? How would you like to be named Israel? And then have a whole nation come after you. Because God made a promise. And as we look at this, Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pastoring the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now, and see about the welfare of your brother and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. If we jump to verse 18, it says, Then they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. And you think your family has problems. <laughs> Go check on your brothers, check on the flock, the animals that they're watching, and then come back and bring me a report. And as he goes and tre treks across the wilderness, we skipped a few verses there where he found some herdsmen and said, I'm looking for my brothers. They told him where to go. He walks up and even before he gets to them, as they see him in the distance, how did they know it was him? Anybody know how, how they knew it was him? Oh, like, oh, oh yeah. He's daddy's favorite. <laughs> Remember, we, we talked about when daddy was a young man and, and he was going to steal the birthright and, and, you know, the blessing. And, and mama, he was mama's favorite. So mama got him all set up. And, and you know, when, when mama or daddy has favorites, that's, that's not good. And uh, uh, and so Israel, Jacob, picked that habit up, and he had a favor with his kids, and he dressed Joseph in a multicolored tunic. And as Joseph's walking through in this beautiful outfit, and here's his brothers, and I'm sure they were wearing the gray kind of drab, 
You know, they're out. Well, they're not out there to impress people. They're out there with the critters. You know, it's it's ugly. It's smelly. It's nasty. They're sleeping on the ground. And here comes their brother with his multicolored coat, beating with dad all the time. And they see him, and they just see themselves. They're so angry. And this family had some problems. Today, we're going to take a look at how that dream began. How it got to this point, and where God took a young man named Joseph. Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you today and I thank you for the anointing that is in this place. And I pray, Father, that this morning I will be simply an instrument for you to play. Lord, that you will flow through me, and I pray each one here will be completely open to hearing your voice. And Father, everything that's said and done is orchestrated by you. Now, Lord, I pray that you would arrest our thought process. Father, that we only allow what you're saying to be poured into us. Lord, I pray again that you would renew our minds this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as we, we look at this dream that, that began, we started last week talking about it, the, excuse me, the dream, the promise that God made to Abraham, and that promise, that dream flowed through him into Isaac, and then into Jacob, now called, called Israel, and then it was poured into Joseph, and Joseph's brothers were not pleased with this dream. Let's take a look at Joseph's actual dream in Genesis chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. It says, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Billa and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Hmm. This is where it started. Not only is he the favorite, but he's a tattletale. How many of you love tattletales? <laughs> he brought back, Joseph brought back a bad report about his brothers to his father. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic that we discussed. And listen to this. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Again, you think your family has problems? Could you imagine a family reunion with this group? Hmm. Verse 5, that, it, it doesn't stop there. Verse 5, then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Let's take a look at the dream. First of all, he says, we were binding sheaves in the field. I've got my sheaves that I'm binding up, and you've got your sheaves that you're binding up. And my sheaves rose up and stood upright. And then when your sheaves saw that my sheaves were standing upright, then your sheaves got up also, and then they bowed down to my sheaves. Can you see where that might upset the man? <laughs> then he said, that's not enough. Then he said, oh, I had another dream. Gather around. Let me tell you my other dream. The sun and the moon and the stars, even the stars were bowing down to me. The 11 stars were bowing down to me as a matter of fact. Now why would Joseph announce Sun, moon, mom and dad, and 11 stars, his brothers, bow down to him. Why would he announce that dream to his family? <laughs> I mean, you look at this. Was it, was it arrogance? Was it ignorance? Was it narcissism? I don't know. 
Let's take a, we'll take a look at his life, and then you tell me how many of you know that sometimes God lets us do stupid things to get his will done. I demonstrate that fact. Thank you very much. Let's take a look at this story before, before we go awry. First of all, and, it kind of. That's what we're going to look at this morning. As we, as we look at the story this morning, his brothers, we know the story. He, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. No, let's throw him in a, in a pit. They throw him in the pit. One of his brothers decided, I'll, I'll rescue him later. I'm kind of ticked that into it. Wouldn't be a bad idea for him to be stuck in that pit for a while. And they throw him in a pit. And the Bible tells us that first the caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead, and they were headed to Egypt. And one of the brothers said, well, there's no sense in us just letting them die here. You know, sounds, sounds kind of heroic. And then he says, let's make some money. <laughs> let's, sell them to, let's sell them to this caravan. And so they sell them, and he heads to Egypt. Once he gets to Egypt, they brought all their slaves out, and they put them up for sale. A guy named Potiphar sees Joseph. He's an important guy to Pharaoh. And, and he sees Joseph and he decides, that looks like the kind of guy that I'd like to have working for me. So he buys them. He puts them in his house. After he's in his house for a little bit, he starts recognizing something. How many of you know when God's hand is upon you, the things that your hand touches gets blessed? Amen. Amen. Ooh, do you believe that? Amen. Uh, I was a friend, Dave Gross, he's a good friend of mine. He pastors over Radiant Life Assembly of God. He was my youth pastor when I was a kid. And I, I love the guy. He's got some great insight for me when I, when I need it. But uh, just, just at Christmas, I was at his house for a get-together. And he, he, was, he was telling that uh, while they were on vacation, God just begins, had, had already begun speaking to him about, about the power when, when we're earthen vessels. We're just clay pots. And we hold a treasure within us if we have Jesus Christ as our Savior. If the same spirit that raised from the dead, raised Christ from the dead, dwells in us, we have this treasure inside this clay jar. And if that treasure is inside, how many of you know if, if you've got if you've got a bright light inside of a of an old shoebox that's got some holes in it, and you walk into a dark room, people are going to see the light trying to get out of that shoebox. And that's the way we are. And he said, God has been dealing with him about that. And he told his son, he said, watch this. And they, they walked into a restaurant. There was nobody in the place. They were traveling, middle of the day, whole family, his son, his grandchildren, his daughter-in-law, his wife. They all go piling into this restaurant. And he said, people are going to start coming in that door. Amen. And his son, Chris, his associate pastor, said, what are you talking about? Man? He said, just watch. They went in and sat down, and all of a sudden, people just started coming in. By the time they got done eating, the restaurant was full, and it was like 2 in the afternoon. And his son, his son said, huh? what, are you, what is this? He said, it's when we're carrying the power of God around. If we really have the power of God, then people are going to know that there's something there, and they're going to want it. They won't even know what. He said, this whole trip, let's watch and see. And so they made an effort to stop at times when, when they knew people wouldn't be at restaurants. And you know, when you're going across country, you stop at a lot of restaurants. He said every time they would go into an empty restaurant, and by the time they got done, the place was full. And he began to, and I thought, Dave, hey, that's, oh, come on. And he began, he began challenging me with that. <laughs> Do we really have the power of God in us? And if so, how should the power of God affect people when it when walks into the room? Shouldn't there, if we are really these clay vessels and that's all there is to us, we're nothing. We shatter. We're broken so easy. How many of you have been broken? We, we, we're, we're clay and we break so easily. And we have this, this power within us so that other people, if they see that power, when they see that power, they're drawn to it. You know, as we look in the Word, we see the story of Jesus and the description of him. The Bible says he wasn't that much to look at. We get all these ideas. We put pictures of Jesus up and man, he's striking. He's rugged. He's handsome. And I, the Bible says he was nothing to look at. What drew people to him was the power of God flowing from him. And we, so don't say, well, I'm not good looking. <laughs> I'm 
not going to even touch that one. But, but the power of God makes you attractive to others. How many of you, how many of you have ever seen Dave Reaver? I love Dave. His brother, uh, Al Reaver, is my pastor. I love that kind of thing. Man, he's my pastor. And every once in a while, I get to spend time with Dave. And Dave was in Vietnam. He had a phosphorus grenade. He was going to clear an area where the sniper had been. They were on a boat, and he pulled the pin. And as he got ready to release that phosphorus grenade, and as he was throwing it past his head, a sniper was aimed right at his head from the bushes and shot. And instead of hitting his head, it went through his hand, hit the phosphorus grenade, blew up as it was going by, blew him off the boat, he continued to burn in the water, and when he came up out of the water, he was still on fire, and they, uh, they thought he was dead, and you can imagine that grenade blowing up right here. And now when he gets up to speak, and look it up online, you will see Dave, if, 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 if he's got a book out called Scars, and, and on the cover of the book, there is a picture of Dave without his makeup on, and it is a scary thing to see him the way he is now. But after you start talking to him, those scars disappear. Any of you that have ever been someplace where Dave was speaking, once he starts speaking, you, you forget about I, the first time I ever saw him in my life. I was at men's conference here in Ohio. I was, I was newly married, about 22 years old. My Uncle Ray and I went down there, and I turned the corner, and he had told me all about Dave Reaver. I turned the corner, and there was a table set up, and Dave was standing at it with some tapes and things, and I jumped. Because it was that bad. But two minutes into him talking, and they had his face up on the big screen because I was sitting back far. But two minutes into him talking, I didn't see those scars anymore. I saw the love of Christ. And I was drawn. And that power, that's what Joseph had. As he, as he stood there on the block and, and, and Potiphar saw something, I've got to have this man. And he bought him as a slave. And then he noticed everything that he touched was blessed. And he decided, he was a smart man. He said, if everything he touches is blessed, I'm going to give him control of my house. And he started seeing blessing upon blessing. He let him have full reign of his home, all his finances. But how many of you know Potiphar's wife also noticed he was a good looking dude? And she decided she was going to seduce him. And one day, she, she under false pretenses, she lured him into a room. And then she said, it's just you and me. Let's have some fun. He said, I wouldn't do this to God. I wouldn't do this to your husband, my master. I'm out of here. And she grabbed his coat as he went to leave. She screamed and held on to his coat and said he tried, to, he tried to molest me. And her husband came home and he was so angry. He grabbed Joseph and threw him in prison. I mean, what else are you going to do? Oh, my God. And here's Joseph. He started out with a dream. He did everything that God had asked him to do. He did everything right. And here he is in prison. You ever been there? Did everything right. He's in prison. The, pri the guy in charge of the prison starts noticing there's something about this guy. There's something inside him. He is a, a clay jar holding something of value. And he saw the power of God within him. And he said, you know what? I'm going to use this guy. And he put him in charge of the jail. One of the prisoners in charge of the jail. And he's, he's running the jail. The, the guy, I mean, everything's going great. And pretty soon, the cupbearer of the king and the baker of the king both somehow tick the king off. And they go, both get thrown into, into the jail that Joseph's in charge of. And they, they're there, they don't know what's going on. What, how many of you know, when the king's mad at you and throws you in jail, something's not good. And they're in the prison there, and, and they've gone from, oh, can you imagine whole, handing the cup to the king himself, and the next moment, you're in jail? And they're in that jail for a little bit. They go to bed one night. Both of them wake up. They're shook. They both had dreams. They don't know what it means. They're talking to people. Finally, Joseph comes to them and says, what's, what's going on, guys? They said, oh, we've had, both of us have had terrible dreams. He said, tell me what they are. I'll, 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 I'll see what we can do. So the chief cupbearer says, I had a, a vine in front of me. And there were three branches on it. They were producing ripe grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my other hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said, well, let me tell you, you had a good dream. He said, uh, he said the three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh's going to take away all the restrictions against you. You're going to come back, and you're going to be serving him again. 
He says, oh, that's wonderful. And the, and the baker said, oh, I can hardly wait for mine. He said, let me tell you about my dream. And he said, three, three baskets of wheat, white bread were on my head, all sorts of baked foods for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating out of them, uh, out of the basket on my, the baskets on my head. He said, what does that mean? And he said, well, the three baskets are also three days. But in three days, you're going to be dead. Three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you, and you will hang on a tree, and the birds will eat of your flesh. And then he looks at, he looks at Pharaoh's cupbearer and says, when you get released from here, in three days it's going to happen. When it does, remember me. Tell about my plight. I don't deserve to be here. I haven't done anything wrong. Please help me. But Joseph's, but Pharaoh's cupbearer forgot all about Joseph. After two years, Pharaoh has a dream. Two years after the interpretation, two years after the, the cupbearer is released, two years later, Pharaoh has this dream. And Pharaoh says, Here's my dream. Up from the Nile came seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed as in, in the marsh grass. Then seven other cows came up, ugly and gaunt. They stood up by the, by the other cows, and the ugly and the gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. He said, then I had another dream. For seven, seven, year, or seven years of grain came on a single stalk. They were plump and good, then seven ears, thin and scorched, by the east wind sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven uh, plump and full ears. And he called all the magicians, all the wise men together, and he said, here's my dreams. Boys, you're on my payroll. I keep you around for something. This dream has been troubling me, both of them. What do they mean? Now, I would, I would at least stick my toe in the water. <laughs> If I, if I was on the payroll and, 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 and he's telling me, hey, you need, to, you need to give me an answer, I'd try and do something, but none of them could remember, could figure out anything. And all of a sudden, after two years, the cupbearer finally remembers this guy named Joseph. And he goes to the king and he says, I know somebody that can interpret that. And he explained the story to him. So Joseph is cleaned up. He's brought in. He said before the king there, and he says, I hear that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph answered and says, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable, favorable answer. How many of you know it's not in us, but it's the Spirit of God within us. He gave him an incredible answer. Genesis chapter 41, verse 25. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. He went on to say, the seven lean and ugly cows that came up after the seven them are seven years, and the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is, a, it is as I have spoken, O Pharaoh, God has shown to you what he is about to do. Verse 32 says, Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise, and sent him over the land of Egypt. He went on and said, if, if you were to gather up one-fifth of the food for the next seven years, so you will have more during the de devastating seven years, then you will make it through this. Not only will you survive, but you will thrive. And how many of you know, uh, it was mentioned in the, the Sunday school class we did a few weeks, weeks ago, when, when the children of Israel got up, and they were leaving, leaving Egypt. And they went out and they started telling people, hey, give that watch you've got on, I need to know the time. Give that to me. And the Egyptians were just handing them whatever. I mean, they were just, the Bible says they were plundering them. But if you look at this, 
You find the re reason Egypt was rich in the first place was because of God's blessing through Joseph. And they were just taking back what God had stored up for them. And I, I know I should have had the verse pulled up. I used to have it on my desk. And basically it says, uh, as far as the wicked and the righteous, the wicked may, may, may prepare it, but the righteous are going to wear it. And that's how God works. And God, God wants us to walk in his favor and to walk in his blessing, even when it seems like the dream has turned into a nightmare. God wants to use that for his glory. And as we allow our lives to be used for his glory, not ours, but his, then he will turn around and we will see blessings that we never expected possible to happen. Pharaoh heard this, this explanation and he said, Joseph, I choose you. You're going to be the man in charge of Egypt and all the crops and all that comes in. And isn't it amazing that God raised Joseph from a prisoner to a prince in less than one day? I want you to think about that. He woke up that morning in prison. Two years after he had spoken to the cupbearer. I'm sure, how many of you think he probably thought, I'm never going to see that dude again. You're welcome. <laughs> and his mind had gone up. I'm probably, I'm, why, why am I here, God? I don't understand it. I'll give you everything I've got. I'll live for you. But this doesn't make a lick of sense to me. And he woke up that morning probably thinking the same thing. It's going to be the same old day. I'm going to go to bed tonight in the same bed. But God turned everything around because Joseph left himself in the center of God's plan, in the sweet spot, even though it wasn't comfortable. Now, as we look on, chapter 42, verse 1, now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. How many of you think by this time, Jacob, Jacob had been around for a while. He's, he, you, ever, you ever met some of those guys when they get older, they get a little bit grumpy? No. Jacob saw that there's grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, well, why are you sitting here, uh, why are you staring at one another? <laughs> why are you sitting here staring at each other, boys? There's grain down in Egypt. Get down there and get some. He said, behold, I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place so that we may live and not die. And then Joseph's brothers came. Remember the dream? The stocks, the all stood up, Joseph stood in the center, and then the other stocks bowed down to him. The dream where the sun, the moon, and the stars, the eleven stars bowed down to him, Joseph's brothers came and they bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. And Joseph recognized them, but they didn't recognize little Joseph who had grown up. Probably he had struggled a little bit, looked a little bit different. They didn't recognize him, and he spoke harshly to them. He looked at them. Uh, this story just cracks me, well, cracks me up and intrigues me and grabs a hold of me. He looks at his 11 brothers who, had, who, who were going to kill him, told his father that, that he had died, sold him, did who knows what with the money, went on with their lives, and he's stuck in this prison. Here they are now, and he looks at them and says, you're a bunch of spies. They said, no, we're not. We're hungry. That's all. We want some food. They didn't know that Joseph understood their language because he spoke to them as if he was from Egypt. And the Bible told, tells us that, that they, they, oh, wait a minute, I got ahead of myself. Uh, they said, we're hungry. He said, how many of you are there? And he said, well, one's, one's dead. Kind of. One's at home with daddy, and then our father's at home. He said, leave one of your brothers here and go get the other one to prove to me that you're not spies and you're telling me the truth. He picked out Simeon. He said, you're staying. So they started bemoaning the fact of how they had treated Joseph and how they were now paying for it and they didn't realize that Joseph understood them. And Joseph had to, had to leave the room and cry. But Joseph sent them home. He said, I'm keeping Simeon. You go home, get your other brother, bring him back. Then I'll know you're not spies. So they started heading home. He said, I'm going to fill up. I'm, I'm gonna, you can go ahead and buy grain, but you better, you better come back. 
So they, they're on their way home, they're halfway home, they open up their grain, they're going to feed their animals a little bit to help them get home. When they open up their bags, they find all the money that they brought and paid for the grain in the bags. Oh no. They didn't take our money, they think we stole this. They go home, they tell daddy all that took place. He said, you stupid boys! You, you, you ever heard that from your dad? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> You stupid boys, why did you tell them that? They said, we didn't, we didn't know where he was going, Dad. We just told him the truth because he said we were spies. We didn't want to get caught in the lies, and we told him. He said, we've got to, take, we've got to go back with, with Benjamin, or you'll never see Simeon again. And Dad, he's so loving. Uh-uh. Simeon, stay with me, boys. I already lost Joseph, my favorite. Benjamin's my second favorite. I'm keeping him with me. Simeon, he's a tough boy. He'll, Prison will toughen him up a little bit. Be good for him. So they waited. How many of you know when there's no food, you wait? They start getting hungry. And finally, they said, Dad, we've got to go. We've got to, we've got to take him. We, if, if, if he does anything wrong to him, then, then kill us. But we've got to go. We're going to die either way. So finally, Dad says, all right, go. And they returned, and they're treated royally. When they leave, Joseph has their bags filled with food. He put their money back in the bag again. But this time he put his silver cup into Benjamin's bag. They're traveling back. They're saying, boy, that guy wasn't so bad after all. Man, I'm glad we got food. And Hey, who's that guy behind us? And up comes the people from Joseph, and they said, you stop. Our master sent us after you. One of you stole his cup. And they said, we did not steal his cup. If you find a thief in the midst of us, you can kill him right here on the spot and take the rest of us as prisoners. You ever been that confident in your brothers? <laughs> can you imagine growing up in that church with those people? <laughs> I've been getting some phone calls as fast as They said... That's, if you find, and he said, I tell you what, if whoever has the cup is going to be my servant, the rest of you get to go home. <coughs> he goes through all the bags, and sure enough, they're in Benjamin's bags. And they begin to moan and cry and wail, and no, take us, take us. So they all went back, and they're all in this room, and Joseph comes in. They begin telling him we didn't take anything. <coughs> Genesis chapter 45, verse 5 says, Well, before we get to that point, they come in and they pour themselves before Joseph. And Joseph reveals himself and says, Boys, I'm a brother Joseph. And in that moment, everything was yeah. yeah. Can you imagine being his brothers? <coughs> seeing the one that you sold into slavery, the one who was in his favor, the one that you hated, when you saw him, you just, oh. And now, here he is, the one in charge. And he says, fellas, it's me. And as the realization starts to set in, this is the dream. This is the dream. It's being fulfilled. And then as they, they sent word, they got home and told their father, your son's not dead, we sold him, we told him he was dead, he's in charge now and he wants us to come. And they loaded up, what was it, 75? Well, there it is. Was it 70? No, 70, Pastor. That was part of the quiz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they loaded them up in carts, they bring them all back. 
Everyone else is suffering. They're in the middle of a drought. There's no food anywhere. Animals are dying. People are thirsty. It's, and here they've, they've got food. They're good to go. God used that. And as they began to hear, I'm sure they heard Joseph's story. Oh, yeah, it wasn't too bad. I got sold to a guy named Potiphar. Everything was going pretty good until his wife started hitting on me, and then I ended up in jail, where I lived for a long time. Then it goes on in Genesis chapter 45, verse 5. It says, Now do not be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve my life, or to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth. And to keep you alive by great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay you shall live in the land of Goshen, and you shall be, shall be near me. You and your children, and your children's children, and your flocks, and your herds, and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come. And you and your household, and all that you have, will be impoverished. And then in verse 20, he says, as for you, you bend evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. What an incredible story. What an incredible dream. And what an incredible miracle of God to bring that dream to fruition. And this year, in 2015, I want us as a church not to be afraid to dream and not to be afraid to reach out and say, God, what is it that you have for my life? I don't know, if you're like me, you find yourself saying, Lord, I've been blessed, but yet I'm still not satisfied. I know there's more. I want that more. God's been speaking to my heart, and I mentioned this to the fellows this morning. So often we find ourselves waiting, waiting for someone else to get excited about the things of God. And once I see them get excited, I'll get a little excited. Once I see them get a little bit more involved, then it'll be happier and more fun, and I'll get involved. And once I see them Bring lift to the church, then I'll, I'll do my part and I'll bring lift to the church. And this morning, God wants you to know, He doesn't want you lifting because someone else is. He doesn't want you joyous because someone else is. He doesn't want you excited because someone else is. He wants you lifting because He has spoken to your heart to lift. He wants you to be joyous because He has put a joy in your heart. God doesn't have, listen to me, God doesn't have grandchildren. You don't get your empowerment through someone else, you get it through God. Amen. And if, if we wait for the excitement, if we wait for, for that thing to happen, that's why people are jumping from church to church to church to church. They're chasing fire. A lot of them are wet blankets, they put it out. God says, don't go over there and drink from their well. Dig a well here. Yes. Amen. Dig a well. Catch fire. 
burn for the glory of God. Amen. Are you dreaming of that dream that God has for you? And are you a dreamer that God can be? God put this on my heart because it convicted me several months back that I had stopped dreaming. I've sat in board meetings and I've laid out plans, told them what I felt God was speaking in my heart. I had a board member say, Pastor, that is incredible. It's wonderful that you see those things. I'm thinking to myself, don't you? <laughs> Doesn't everybody else see this? I mean, it looks obvious to me. But then I got to a point where I stopped seeing it. I got tired. And God convicted my heart and said, why have you stopped dreaming? And as I prayed, I felt like God was saying, this church needs to experience the ability to dream. To dream big dreams. I'd like for the ushers to come. We're going to receive communion this morning. And Dennis, do you have that song? Part of the Herald? The video? Yep. If you would cue that up for me while the fellows are coming. This morning. While they're cueing that up, That's I want to explain to you, as we start out the new year and we celebrate the crucifixion of Jesus Christ our Lord, as we celebrate with communion, if you're a guest here, maybe you haven't celebrated communion with us before, I want you to know that we practice open communion. If your heart is right with Jesus Christ, if you are his servant and he is your Lord. And you want to celebrate with us, we gladly invite you to participate. We want you to enjoy as we come into his presence and remember what he's done for us. But the Bible also says that there are many of you that have infirmities, that are sick, that are struggling because you've received communion without having your heart right here for him. That means sin. James says if you want an explanation of sin to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, that is sin. And so we're going to have a word of prayer before the ushers distribute the emblems. If you're here today and you want to partake with us, please do. We want to celebrate with you. If you're here today and you know in your heart you should not be receiving communion, you have two choices. I would pick the first, and that is to make your heart right. Listen to me this morning. You don't need, you don't need to have a wooden altar in the front of the church to find forgiveness. You need a repentant heart right where you're at. And if you confess your sins, he will forgive them. And he will wash you. And he will make you white with snow. If you choose not to take that option, then I would encourage you, don't feel like you have to take the envelopes. Just pass them on. No one will judge you. No one will judge you. you know, just have a word of prayer. And then the envelopes. The fellows are going to serve the envelopes. The time for us to, to look at our own hearts and our own lives. Father, Lord, I thank you that we can dream. And finding that dream is spending time in prayer. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Having that right relationship so that we can communicate with you. And communication, Father, I thank you. It's two-way and you want to speak into our lives so much. Now I pray that, that our hearts are right with you. Right. Father, I put this congregation in your hands. I pray that your glory is being fulfilled. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we distribute the
Jim Lewis, you fellas have put that video up there. I want you to be willing and ready to dream. We did. Lord knows a handsome man that can knock the music and just does the music. Right. I apologize, I bet you I did that. I was working on the sound system this week. <laughs> we'll play that next week. It will be wonderful. Mm -hmm. morning as we consider dreaming the dream. And we reflect back on that moment where Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room. And they had dreams. The sons of thunder, James and John, their mother even went to Jesus and said, how about putting my boys on both sides of your right your left hand? Those fellows had dreams they were going to be powerful men. And they were, but they had no idea the way it was going to be. All of them but John were going to be martyrs. Who died for the gospel of Jesus Christ. John was going to be exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. Again, I believe those men realized, began recognizing that they were living the dream. Because every day they walked and they saw the, the church attitude daily. They saw people being healed and set free, people being saved, the power of the Spirit of God moving among them to the point that people came and, and wanted them to pray over prayer cloths so that they could. They could take them and put them on people and they actually saw them be healed. 
They were bringing people out where the disciples were walking so that their shadow might touch where the person was so that they would be healed. You talk about living the dream. Can you imagine healing all the people in Walmart? Amen. <laughs> Can you imagine walking through a hospital and putting them out of business? Hallelujah. Can you imagine walking through a jail and having everything hand on people and watch their life transform. We have, we have power in our hands. That is part of living the dream and God wants to pour through you. That's why he says to lay on, laying holy hands upon people and lifting up holy hands. He wants to empower us. And as he, as he was there with his disciples, encouraging them, getting ready to, to dispatch them, knowing that in a short period of time, everything for them was going to change. He knew what they were going to go through, and he was beginning to plant in them that dream of what their life was meant to be. He looked at them, and he broke the bread. He said, fellas, this bread... What I just did with this bread of breaking and tearing it in two, that's what's going to happen to my body. But it's going to be for you. So that you can live the dream. So that you can live a life with the blessed hope before you. So that you can lay up treasures in heaven that no one can steal from you. Even if they take your life, they can't take your eternal reward. Father, I thank you for the body of Christ that was broken for me so that I could live a dream, not just survival, not just living day to day, Lord, not even living on what I hope might happen tomorrow in this world. Father, I thank you for the blood of Christ. I thank you that by it, every sin that is repented of is covered. Lord, thank you for the blood that demonstrates grace, your unmerited favor. But Father, help us not to sin so that we see more grace. But help us to possess more grace so 
so that we can use it to cover the sins of this world and demonstrate your love to the lost and dying. Oh, Father, that we might live the dream beginning today, throughout this year, and until we stand in your presence. I thank you for the blood of Christ in Jesus' name. Let's receive together. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for the promise. The promise being Jesus Christ. Born with the plan to die, to rise again, to conquer death, hell, and the grave. To go to your right hand and intercede for me, for us. And while he's interceding for us, he has sent your spirit himself to dwell inside of us while he builds a home for us that he's finishing up right now and he's getting ready to go and bring us home. Hallelujah. 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 And that statement is truer than I can express to you. In our house, we've got a bell. Tish keeps by the door. And when it's dinner time and we're out in the yard working in the woods, in the barn, she rings the bell. Says it's supper time. We know it's time to go in. God's getting ready to ring the bell. It's time to go. Getting ready to point at that angel and say, Lord, your trumpet. I'm ready to bring my children. We need to be ready. We need to be living in such a way that we're ready for the trumpet to sound We're about his business. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot, without blemish. That means he's coming back for a clean church. We need to be that church. Now, Father, I speak a blessing over each one under the sound of my voice. Father, the altar call has been going on for a while. As you've been speaking to our hearts. And I speak the blessing of softened hearts. Lord, I, I speak the blessing of allowing your gentle hand to come into each life. Lord, I speak the blessing of walking in righteousness and holiness. I speak the blessing of of letting go and allowing you to run our lives. I speak the blessing of living in forgiveness and walking in that grace. I speak the blessing of a new year. I speak the blessing of a new life. I speak the blessing of a new hope. Father, I speak the blessing of living your will out in our lives, the blessing of living the dream, not only in 2015, but until that trumpet sounds. Now, Lord, I know as that blessing is received, it's going to be experienced and demonstrated. I count it as done now, Father, and I look forward to the miraculous precious name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone that received that said, Amen. Amen.